Hi, and welcome back to The European VC, the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love the show, share it with your friends and join our newsletter at eu.vc. Today, we're happy to welcome Frederick, co-founder and general partner of 415 Capital. He's been an investor in more than a dozen of innovative medical technology companies and currently serves as a board director at Cardiac Success and R3 Vascular. If you enjoy our content, do support us by hitting the follow button, giving us a review and following the European VC on LinkedIn. Vaban, a Qatar company, is the easiest way to launch and run your venture investing. An all-in-one integrated solution to form syndicates, VC funds, and co-investment SPV programs built for scale. Supporting the next generation of global venturers from fundraising to exits, Vaban provides an automated back office, allowing their clients to focus on what matters, finding the next unicorn and building their network. Vaban has facilitated over $1 billion of capital invested in companies such as Revolut, Bolt, and Airbnb. To learn more, please reach out at vaban.io forward slash EUVC. And don't forget to mention EUVC. Frederick, welcome to the European VC podcast. It's super nice to have you here. I must say uh, to our listeners that we started out, out this conversation talking about Oktoberfest, and I'm incredibly jealous that I wasn't there. Frederick, how was Oktoberfest? Uh, it was very good. It was very good. You know, first time in, in three years after the pandemic. So great to see people get together. I got the most out of it, I think. So went four times in one week, and um, I'm still here. So all good. And today's episode is a tutorial on how to binge drink at Oktoberfest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, Frederick, jokes aside, super nice to have you. Um, tell our, all, all of our listeners, who's Frederick? How did you get into venture? Very briefly, but more importantly, what is 415 Capital? And uh, maybe even tell us the story behind the name. That's an interesting name, actually. Thanks for having me here. Um, you know, my path to venture, I think, has been a bit sort of non-traditional. I, I started my career in investment banking, worked in, in London and New York for several years. And um, there's a bit of a family history of, of why I ended up in, in medtech specifically. So, so my father was a, a medical device distributor, so kind of was exposed to that whole thing from a young age. And then um, sort of uh, after, I didn't want to become a banker uh, sort of for the rest of my life. So I, I quit my job, moved back to Germany and sort of helped run a medical device distribution company together with my father and our third partner, who is the third GP in our fund uh, today. And um, sort of we were focused on, on bringing pretty innovative technologies to market, helping startups get the initial traction that, that they needed, get some clinical data, and then eventually sort of uh, find a, a good strategic home through an acquisition or, or bringing those companies public. And along the way, we also invested as angel investors in these companies from a relatively early stage and sort of started to build a very good investment track record. And then, you know, all of a sudden we thought, hey, we, sh we should do this for a living. This is, this is a lot of fun. So, so then we sort of turned from medical device distribution to sort of, I'd say, an operator VC or sort of a value add yeah. early development stage investor to, to kind of leverage the network and the market access that we had to help our portfolio companies. Expand a bit more on uh, the network and market access part because that's a, it's a key part of your differentiator. Yeah, that, that's right. So we work very closely with a lot of clinical sites, so hospitals, research institutions, and sort of the, the influencers in medicine, we call them key opinion leaders. Um, you know, product market fit, how it's called in venture, is, is sort of front and center of our investment strategy. So we like to invest in things that we uh, see that the end customer Customer gets very excited about. Uh, so that's sort of also how we de-risk when we make certain bets. I think that's that's at the core. You know, in addition to that, it's it's a pretty sort of long way, and, and it can get quite expensive to get uh, technologies to market because you need to run clinical trials, you need to get a reimbursement in place for new technologies. So the more often you do that, you know, the easier it gets because you know the people you need to work with, the people who have a track record. So in a nutshell, that's sort of uh, how we're thinking yeah. about that. A couple of cool topics there that I want to deep dive, but I want I want to come back to four fifteen. <laughs> what does that name come from? Uh, that, that's a very good uh, question. Actually, that's how we actually got introduced. I think I commented on, on one of your memes that was sort of YOLO investments or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. It was, it was, it was, was it YOLO or was it FOMO? I can't remember. Nah, yeah, it was I, YOLO. It was YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, our story isn't that crazy. It, it was just a number that uh, the three partners had an emotional kind of relationship with um, that we picked. Uh, it's actually an address. We, we haven't really specifically told anyone, just you know, a handful of LPs. But you know, we like to have a number in the name because it shows us typically at the top of the cap table alphabetically or when we attend conferences, we're typically shown first with our logo. So that was a nice byproduct. <laughs> I like that. I love that. Very cool. And you, you said something that I wasn't aware of. So I, I think I understood correctly. So you guys are uh, kind of almost 
family-led VC firm, right? To some extent. Yeah, I wasn't aware of yeah, that. Yeah, that's very yeah. cool, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's how I got started. Yeah. Enlighten me a bit. <laughs> Honestly, <'cause laughs> we talk a lot, and, and Andres is passionate about about the topic. Actually, he wrote a book on it. You know, family-owned businesses and the, and the challenges and succession and so on. And you know, we talk a lot about it in the family office world as well. So, how do you look at it in your own firm? Right, you're, you're going to fund two. You're building a hopefully a sustainable VC firm in the long run, and how do you think about family dynamics in managing the VC firm? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a pretty complimentary um, thing that happened because of you know my father's uh, background and all that network with physicians and, and, and everything that he's built over the years, and then sort of I guess my experience with um, investing, portfolio management, it turned out quite well. I would say. Um, I think you know over the medium and long term, obviously we. Um, it was always front and center. How, how do you think about succession? How do you build a lasting organization that is not just dependent on, on either my father or, or myself? And uh, I think we've, we've spent a lot of time on that. We've, we've made some great hires. And, but that's, you know, I guess, one of the challenges and opportunities that come with um, having that history. So, Fred, you know, we don't let anyone off the hook easy. <laughs> yeah. um, it's always a big question for LPs, right? Um, or I should maybe more say that because it's more typical in the founder space that you have rather starting a business or something together, where VCs oftentimes dive into that and say, how well do you actually know what you're doing here? How prepared are you for what you're going into and all that kind of thing? Uh, how was that experience for you with your LP base? Did you have those questions, those doubts about whether is it wise to be doing this as a family thing? I mean, the family angle is, is part of the history, but it's, you know, we're, we're two out of eight people. It's much more than sort of a father and son relationship, if you will. And I think we have a pretty compelling track record to, to point out to LP. So, you know, even before setting up uh, Fund One, we've made 45 investments and we've realized 25 portfolio exits. So that, that definitely sort of helped us gain momentum with LPs and, and sort of tell a story. And am I right, Frederick, in saying that you also, in your infant one, came with a significant chunk of the capital from your side? The story about that really is our way of operating um, was very well received with entrepreneurs because for uh, you know an operator, an operating partner, or a distributor to have skin in the game and also invest in these companies kind of aligned a lot of the interests. And that's what we will continuously look to do with the fund as well. So, so the strategy really is a continuation of what we had built over the years, just with uh, more meaningful check sizes, if, if you will. You've done quite a few early stage angel investment first, and now you're more towards series A and B. So tell us a bit about why you, you ended up there when you chose to, to professionalize, in quotation marks. Even as angels, we invested around the same round. So sometimes, um, you know, small tickets around the seed stage to have a foot in the door and, and to make sure that we can continue to have access to these opportunities. But in terms of stage, um, it didn't really change much. Um, the angel investments we made, they were quite meaningful also in terms of size. So obviously they weren't to the tune of 5 million or so, but we invested up to 3 million. Um, and we also syndicated a lot. So they were sort of projects that we started or companies that we co-founded as angel investors, if you will, by providing the first five to seven million, uh, you know, in a, in a broader group of people within a, a network of fellow uh, medtech entrepreneurs and, and operators. Frederick, I sh don't get me wrong, because <laughs> I started venturing in life sciences space, but I want to ask the question in the following way. You're doing medtech, which for many is like the coming together of two terrible things, <laughs> which is highly regulated space, <laughs> you know, yeah. regulatory pathways. That means a lot of time. Uh, for many, and also typically, not necessarily, but typically hardware, <laughs> right? Is that so? And if not, debunk that myth, but also share with us, you know, have you had these kind of conversations with prospective LPs and how do you navigate that and how do you manage expectations to what this space is and what this space is not? Right, right. That's a very good question. And obviously, we get asked that a lot. It's been quite difficult for, I think, a lot of firms to make money on Medtech investments. That's why a lot of them have shifted over to the biopharma side in, in recent years. And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that side. I mean, for us, it is, of course, highly regulated, but so is biopharma. That means that there's some barriers to entry, right? And um, so I think the future to be, or in my personal opinion, in order to be successful in the space, you either have to have a gigantic platform, and you're seeing that, right, with uh, some you know traditional big private equity groups acquiring stakes and life science VCs. Or you have to be extremely specialized. And that's sort of where we fall in, if, if, if you will, right? So in terms of access to deals, if you're a company that's uh, meeting milestones, if you have a, a superstar team, they're going to seek out either to collaborate with a big platform or with a, a you know someone who's very specialized to give them.
them access to to things that they otherwise wouldn't have, and and potentially a combination of both, right? That's why we sometimes uh, you know we syndicate, we co-invest with bigger funds as well, and it's also always nice to share in the risk. So from that perspective, it is a challenging market to navigate, but it gets easier through specialization, right? Because we don't do anything else. If we look at a new project in the neuro space, for example, I mean we don't have to um, start reading neuroscience 101 or, or something like that. We have a pretty sort of good base of of expertise and 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 access to clinicians that we can leverage across projects. So that makes it much easier, if, if you will. And I guess at the end of the day, sort of uh, the returns profile is a bit different. And, and, and at least, you know, I can only speak to, to ours. We have a distribution, I guess, that's less power law, like you would see in the tech space or maybe in biopharma, where obviously you have a very, very small number of, of deals that sort of make the difference and move the needle for a fund. I think our median sort of portfolio company return has been around 3.7x or so over the past. So um, it's a bit more consistent and maybe more to the tune of what you would expect to see in, in, in private equity or, or PE on steroids or something. That's also, to my understanding, and again, enlighten me if not, to my understanding, that's a function of two things, the model in medtech because of the regulatory process, right? But also the stage at you're at. So it's not necessarily, when you understand the space, it's not necessarily unexpected that your profile is as is, considering you know how to pick, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we invest with a lot of conviction. So obviously, we do take some technical risks, some R&D risks, but there's a way to mitigate that. that. So you you back teams that are have a, uh, some very strong engineers with a track record who have access to resources, who are maybe part of an accelerator, uh, who can iterate uh, very quickly. We don't take a lot of science risk, per se. I think there's some clinical risk. But again, if you work with the right people who have brought products from inception to sort of FDA approval, then it's much more likely to be successful the, the second, third, and fourth time, right, rather than having um, first timers do that. And, and that's how we look to mitigate some of those risks, if, if you will. That's why, I guess, we don't have that many outliers sort of at the bottom, more of a sort of a normal distribution. I think, Frederick, that this ties very well into your value proposition as a fund. And I, I'd love for us to dive a bit more into it because it features very prominently <laughs> as to yeah. why founders pick you. So tell us a bit about your uh, correct medical uh, framework and how that, that works. That's a good question. So um, Correct Medical was sort of our last uh, medical device distributor. We actually sold the company to um, a publicly listed strategic last year. But um, as part of that deal, we, we've started a, a strategic partnership with that group. So it's it sort of brought, I guess, our operational value add to the next level, whereas on the distribution side, we were focused on, on really helping companies gain traction in the sort of the German-speaking part of Europe. We can now offer them more of a pan-European platform and access to, to clinical sites beyond you know, Germany and the Nordics, for example, and, and Southern Europe, etc. Typically, we sit down with them. We have a, a committee. We look at, across our portfolio. We explore opportunities where companies in our investment portfolio have reached a certain stage and they could benefit from that bigger commercial platform. And they make about 2 billion euros in revenues a year. So it's, it's quite a powerful commercial channel for our portfolios to, to explore. It's always you know, at the option of the portfolio company. Sometimes it makes sense if they sort of commercialize themselves, but oftentimes it's, it's not the best use of, of expensive venture euros to build your own distribution network and, and structure if you look to get acquired by a big corporate uh, anyways, right? Because they will bring their own sales force into this at, at some point. Yeah, I think for me, when I first went on your website, I saw something unexpected. So I saw like this huge highlight in cardiovascular disease as an example. And I don't know if that is something that you guys have updated that it's 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 filtering or not. So my question is around you know when we talk about you spoke about specialization and right now we spoke about value add right, which as you say and I agree they go hand in hand in this space right very much so. And so does this mean that I should read this as you know four fifteen is doing med tech focusing in, in cardiovascular disease? Is that the specialization level that we're talking about or am I misreading what I saw? You're largely right. I mean, we, we do have a lot of expertise in cardio and neuro and increasingly robotics is where we've, um, we've also invested. So I, I think at the core of our investment thesis is sort of, we look at this as sort of the biggest challenge in healthcare that we're dealing with, which is sort of chronic diseases, right? As part of that cardio and neuro, that's, that's probably the biggest problem we, we face as a healthcare system, right? Because it's, it's, it's the number one killer worldwide. It drives most healthcare costs by, by significant margin. And it leads yep. to a lot of deaths and, and poor patient outcomes. It's an economic factor, but it's also it's about patient impact. So we see that there's a lot of opportunity to innovate here, to diagnose earlier, to treat earlier, more sustainably, keep people out of the hospital, uh, allow people to, to uh, live a better quality of life. And at the end of the day, save, save costs to our healthcare system, right? So um, it's been a, a topic that's started much earlier, the cost pressure. But now with COVID and everything, I think it's, it's, become, it's come to the forefront yeah. that um, we, we can continue to spend like this on our healthcare system. We need to be able to do this better. I think that goes without saying, honestly, and even for the skeptic ones. But if I go back to my experience fundraising in life sciences space, 
the question that we got the most. And we were we were earlier stage, and we were doing uh, drug development, med tech, diagnostics, and e health as well. So the, the scope was a bit bigger, obviously, because it was earlier stage. And the question we got the most was one: Is there enough deal flow? Second: Is that deal flow any good? Right? With your level of expertise. I actually have that question myself. So how do you explain that, you know, the quality deal flow that is out there in this space within your geographical scope, right, and reach? That's a good question. So, um, I mean, it's, it's a very big market in terms of the overall opportunity, but it's also a small market in terms of there's a limited number of, of talent. You know, as you know, talent is very scarce. Yeah. And these are highly specialized teams that we work with, right? So you, you don't have, you know, your college dropouts who are developing an app or, you know, some grocery delivery platform. It's, it's These are sort of biomedical engineers and, and physicians who have sort of studied their entire life and prepared their entire life to innovate in the space. So uh, when they do something successfully, they don't just go away and retire. They typically do another project and another project. So they're sort of repeat yeah. offenders, if you will. So you know, <laughs> the more focused you are on a market like that, the better access you also get, right? And, and so typically, the investment opportunities we get to look at and we have the privilege of looking at are typically projects from people that we that we already know because they've been sort of part of management from previous project or uh, they've been introduced to us by a physician who we trust and et cetera. So there's a lot of pre-selection in terms of what we look at in, in our deal funnel, but we don't look at thousands of deals a year. I think uh, within our strategy, we look at probably, you know, 500 or, or something, maybe three to 500. So, you know, our current portfolio for fund one, we're, we just closed our eighth investment and we've looked at 800 companies, but they were sort of already somewhat pre-selected. So we have, I guess, a selection rate of around 1%. And that sort of gives us comfort that we can still be selective enough to make uh, reasonable investments. So, Frederick, I have two questions for you now. First of all, or maybe secondly, because it should probably go in that direction. I want to hear about Fund 2 and why, what you're thinking and, and, and planning and how you're adjusting things based on your learnings from Fund 1. But my first question that I'd love for you to tackle is, there's not a lot of VCs that are transparent about the multiples, but you actually have it on your website. 4.3, realize the multiple. I'd love if you could just tell all the VCs in Europe why you believe in transparency and why you're putting that number out there for everyone to see. I think it's very important because it's it's also you know fair to the entrepreneurs who are pitching to us, right? So they, I think they have a, a right to know sort of you know, at, at a reasonable detail, what our strategy is, what our history is, you know, what our ticket size is. I, you know, we, we're finding the same thing. We also need to fundraise. We need to talk to LPs. We need to sort of understand what are the high value targets for us, if, if you will, right? So I think transparency around your strategy, um, how you're deploying money, I think that that is very important. Now let's shift to fund two, Frederick. Yeah. Tell me about how are you thinking and what have you learned from fund one that, that you know, is causing you to do adaptations in fund two? You know, syndication is a big part of any transaction, I guess, that we, we deal with. So we're, we're typically not the only investors. We work pretty hard to get other investors to back our companies. We, we've sort of uh, observed an opportunity that we could invest more at the same stage and take a bit more ownership. I think that was one of the key learnings that we had for Fund 1. We set out to sort of own between 5 and 20% at the time of exit with Fund 1 by investing between 5 and 10 million per company over the life cycle. And with the new fund, we're looking at investing in the same rounds, but keeping more to ourselves because we, we find ourselves doing a lot of the heavy lifting in many cases. Why not take more ownership, if, if you will? So we would love to get that to closer to 15 to 25% at, at time of exit. That also will come with more concentration in the portfolio, so less bets or shots on goal. What's been your thinking there? Why are you you know, still comfortable put, taking yeah, that yeah. on? I don't think more concentration. I mean, obviously, we're looking to raise a bigger fund, um, and I think we have good traction. So in terms of the, the number of portfolio companies, we're, we're not going to end up with a more con concentrated portfolio necessarily. Ah, but you'll have more per dollar invested, right? You'll have more concentration. So in that sense, I'd, I'd say that the exposure to each company increases on the fund level. It is a high exposure rate to each company. Yeah, I mean, historically, we've had, a, I think, a loss rate of around a quarter. That makes us comfortable to, to make sort of high conviction investments. I, I guess there's also some de-risking that we can do ourselves, which is helpful. You know, we, we, we spend a, a lot of time with our portfolio partners when it comes to clearly defining milestones, making sure, sort of, you know, really exploring how, how we can be of value to meet those by, um, you know, leveraging our net network, bringing new clinicians on board, you know, helping with certain regulatory advisors we know, et cetera. So I think that that's at the core of the strategy. It's funny, I, I kind of I didn't say anything. I was interested to see how Andreas was reacting because what I saw in the life sciences space, mostly drug dev and, and med tech, it's actually standard, right? So in, in the fund that we were raising, you know, early stage, the target at exit was around 9, 10. And if we increased the fund size slightly, which we actually ended up because of an institutional LP, we were actually going to 12-ish, right? So yeah. for me, it's actually very normal that you say at that stage, which is the later stage that you're targeting those, those 20-ish on average, right? Yeah. Percent. But I think it, it shows, I think it shows a lot the difference in models from 
tech investing, traditional tech investing, and med tech investing, right? Uh, I don't know if you have any comment on that, Frederick, though. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. And that's sort of what we sometimes are challenged with, or at least in the market environment that we had in the last couple of years, right, where, where the economy was just like overheating, everything was going great. You had all these portfolio companies raising money every six months at a, at a, at a double valuation or something like that. Obviously, we don't, our, our market doesn't operate like that. So in times like that, it's sometimes difficult to sort of uh, grab the attention of LPs, etc. But, um, you know, we're more like the steady eddies, right? So we're, we're, we're doing okay in an upturn, but we're also doing pretty well in the downturn. So that's the nature of, of sort of the market that we're in and then medtech. The beauty of it is that the regulatory nature of it means that the value inflections are super well defined. And there's actually this kind of third party that defines that, right? So it's from that perspective, and, and I strongly believe that's why this space in terms of an investing proposition is much more robust to market conditions. Right. Yeah, that's that's a very good point, because, you know, obviously we've also seen valuations increase in, in recent years. Now, obviously, there's a moderating a little bit, but it's very difficult for a sort of a, a startup uh, CEO to to justify, uh, you know, raising around at a 200 million pre-money valuation without having done a single patient. Right. So obviously you get shut down pretty quickly. So so it, it's a bit easier in this market to be disciplined, I guess, when it comes to valuation. And there's less FOMO from the life science investors. It's a bit more, I guess, old school, normal, less emotional. Is your um, exit route of choice trade sale, or are you also doing one like this? Yeah, I'd say 80 to 90% trade sale. Um, you know, there's a limited number of companies who acquire, and we know them quite well. And that impacts the valuation conversation a lot, right? Because they understand very well the value of, of each kind of proposition you have for them, right? Exactly. We always back solve, right? Whenever we, we look at valuation, we always back solve for, we, we, we have a good sense for, you know, what kind of amount uh, these uh, companies sort of go for after what kind of milestones. So that's where every sort of valuation discussion really starts. And then we sort of, we adjust for risk and we adjust for, you know, capital intensity to, to meet uh, certain milestones, et cetera. So before we go into the quick fire round, I have a final question. And I, I guess Andreas might have a follow up or two, maybe. And if he does, I'll, I'll give him enough, enough time for it. But I think, Frederick, what would be cool to ask you is, you know, with, we had COVID. Now we have, you know, the whole market is, is, is crazy. You know, no one really knows what's going to happen in the next couple of months. But many of the founders I know, personally in uh, biotech and medtech, I saw many of them doing bridge rounds that I Honestly, I wasn't expecting if you would ask me before. What have you seen there? Have you seen that dynamics a lot? Do you have like a rationale and a kind of a generalization to why that was happening or not? There are some good reasons for doing bridge rounds, but there are also sometimes terrible reasons, right? Because uh, you, you know, you're, a bridge can turn into a peer, <laughs> which, which you want to avoid, right? With COVID, obviously, we've seen some delays in clinical programs, right? Because uh, you know a lot of hospitals shut down for everything except for COVID, right? Elective procedures got delayed. People who had sort of strokes and heart attacks didn't end, end up going to the hospital because they were afraid of catching COVID, which, which is very unfortunate. So some milestones have been missed, and, and, and that's why people try to extend runway without putting a value on, on, on the company. The good scenarios in which we like to do bridges are actually when we see a lot of strategic options and we just want to you know, get more clarity on, on what is the right path for the company we want to explore. We want to make a consensus decision at the board to go uh, this way or to go the other way. That's when I think bridges make sense. But uh, I think during COVID, probably valuation, fear, fear of putting a, a price tag on a company and, and really uncertain times, I guess. I could ask you about how you think about, you know, portfolio construction and modeling considering bridge rounds, but let's not deep dive into that one. We'll keep that for another another time we talk. I think it's a good time we move into uh, the quick fire round. So the quick fire round is only ask you a couple, three actually, quick answer questions, 30 to 60 seconds each. Frederick, are you ready? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I'm sure you are. First question, in medtech, what areas, sectors or technologies excite you the most? And in this case, I would ask you to not say cardiovascular diseases or, or, you know, whatever kind of disease category, but more about the technologies or the solutions that are out there that you feel you're super excited about these days. I am quite excited about sort of neuromodulation, neurostimulation as, as a sort of a treatment mod modality. And we've had some experiences uh, with this for, for conditions like sleep apnea, for example. But I think there are many others like dementia, Alzheimer's, etc. So that is definitely something that um, I think is still in its infancy. And uh, there's a lot of potential patient benefit. Brain computer interfaces, I'm sure you sort of you're familiar with Neuralink and everything, obviously because uh, Elon Musk is an investor in that, but uh, that's also really not far away from prime time, if, if you will, but but I think the promise and, and what you could do with the sort of technology that's uh, it's immense. So that that gets us excited. Uh, and then just uh, you know more broadly, probably sort of neurodegenerative disorders and, and, and how we, we, we treat them and, and how we can sort of diagnose this earlier and, and help patients. Second question of the quick fire round, uh, Frederick, which is what are your top tips? for emerging GPs out there in Europe who are now fundraising? 
It's an interesting question because, I mean, we're an emerging GP. So. To your peers, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, I guess I can sort of only sort of lessons learned from my perspective, I think probably, yeah, sort of leverage your network, sort of warm intros uh, are always very helpful when, when you approach uh, LPs. You know, no, no one likes to get cold calls. I think the same is true also for you know portfolio companies raising money from from VCs. It's a lot about sort of research and, and due diligence and, and focusing on sort of high value targets. Yeah. To the earlier point, that's where transparency I think in the marketplace is quite important. Uh, so so people can use their time wisely and, and approach the people who can who can be a good fit, not just in terms of uh, check size, but also in terms of strategy and, and yeah. where there's a value add potentially. And then I guess patience, right? Because it always takes longer than you think, uh, and especially in, in, in sort of uncertain times like today, it's not going to get easier for emerging managers. To, to raise funds. Third and final question, which is one of my favorites actually, is what has been the most counterintuitive learning you've had since you've been in venture? Raising bigger funds may be easier than raising small funds, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Because of how the sort of institutionals and, and LPs operate, if you're sort of under a certain size, if you're you know under 100 or 150 million, then uh, you know the, the, the math doesn't work for them. They they want to commit at least 50 to 20 million. They don't want to be more than 10 or 20 percent of your LP base. So that that was an, a learning that was very counterintuitive when we uh, set out to do this, uh, and that's why it was not easy to raise the, our first fund. <laughs> and the other way around, Frederick, because if you had gone out and said we're raising 250 as our fund one, you know. Quite a few people would have probably said, well, are you out of your mind? <laughs> so it's yeah, not only counterintuitive, exactly. it's also a dichotomy that we can't really escape it. You have to get through fund one, which whatever vertical you're in is going to be smaller than probably have been the, yeah. the best from an objective standpoint or, or from, you know, not thinking about LP dynamics there. But Frederick, thanks so much for joining us today. It was awesome having you. I think it was interesting for me at least to get an, a, a peek inside a world that I don't really look that much at normally. So very interesting, Frederick. Thanks, million. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of The European VC, the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love the show, share it with your friends and join our newsletter at eu.vc. Vaban, a Qatar company, is the easiest way to launch and run your venture investing. An all-in-one integrated solution to form syndicates, VC funds, and co-investment SPV programs built for scale. Supporting the next generation of global ventures from fundraising to exits, Vaban provides an automated back office, allowing their clients to focus on what matters, finding the next unicorn and building their network. Vaban has facilitated over $1 billion of capital invested in companies such as Revolut, Bolt and Airbnb. To learn more, please reach out at vaban.io forward slash EUVC. And don't forget to mention EUVC.